Good morning, fellow gardeners. I'd like to welcome you to the splendid world of succulents. This is, workshop is presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County and is actually a two-part workshop. This is part one. The second part is how to propagate succulents. My name is Sandy Fitzpatrick and I'll be your moderator today. This workshop is being recorded. It will be available on the Master Gardener website after it has been uploaded. The link to that video and all the accompanying resources that you're gonna see in this presentation can be accessed at pcmg.ucanr.org. Our presenter, Diane Arnold, has been a master gardener since 2011. She loves to garden with succulents. You'll hear her enthusiasm. And she likes to share her knowledge with others about these unique plants. Diane is unable to join us today, but we have recorded her presentation. With that, Barbara, please start the recording. Hi, thank you, Sandy, for that nice um, introduction. I appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank Barbara, another uh, fellow master gardener who is behind the scenes, making sure these Zoom presentations are uh, viewed for our public. So thank you to both of you very much. Um, as Sandy mentioned, um, I have a special interest in succulents and I'd like to, for the next hour, share with you two parts of, uh, about succulents. The first part is a general information about just what are succulents and how to best grow them in Placer County. And the second part or the second module is how to propagate. So I hope that you'll also join me for the second part. So this is really an hour presentation that's been broken into two parts for your viewing pleasure. First of all, let's talk about who are master gardeners so we can build some credibility of why listen to us. Well, master gardeners were across um, the United States in, in most states. And what you're interested in, in is here in Placer County. And what we do is we extend, as the first bullet point explains, research-based information about sustainable gardening and composting. And the information we share with you is research-based. That's one of our dictums, if you will. We can't give you grandmother's recipe. It has to be research-based. So you can pretty much trust what we're going to say to you. Where do you find us? Well, we are all over the place. We have lots of sources for you to tap into. Two of my favorite on this list here is the hotline. You can call this number at any time. They have limited hours, so you may not get a live voice, but you can leave a recording. Or even better is if you wake up in the middle of the night with a burning question about your garden, you can get online and submit your question um, to the hotline as well and get that off your chest so you can go back to sleep. We have a social media presence, as you can see, with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have monthly columns. And one of my favorites down here at the bottom of the list is the uh, gardening guide and calendar. I love to use that as my journal every month. If you flip to the month and even if you look ahead, it will tell you what you should be doing in your garden. And so I use that to record my activities so I can remember. And since uh, becoming a master gardener, I have 10 years of those uh, calendars of which I refer back to. And finally, where else do you find us? We are at a lot of workshops, fairs, festivals, and special events, obviously, with the pandemic, we weren't able to do that, but as things open up, we should uh, be able to see you in person. You may be familiar with some of the workshops we ho um, hold, Farmer's Market in Auburn and Roseville, the Garden Fair, hopefully we'll see you next spring with that, and also uh, particularly the Mother's Day Garden Tour, which is in May. It's about 30 years old. We're kind of famous for that, so hope you'll partake in that next year. Where do you find us? Obviously, you know our website or you wouldn't be viewing this presentation today, but please make sure you check it out in more detail. You see this yellow toolbar. If you click on one of these, you'll have a pull down screen and we have a lot of information to share with you. A lot of the articles written are from master gardeners as well as other experts in the field of gardening. So please make sure you check that out further. I wanted to let you know that there are handouts available for you where you found this uh, 
uh, workshop, you'll also find handouts posted. So don't worry about taking copious notes during this presentation. I've got some good handouts for you. I've got the varieties that I'll go over, uh, how do you select um, and grow succulents, and then some common pests and problems. Also, there's a page of resources for you if you feel inclined to read more information about succulents. And I hope that you will. They're such amazing and interesting plants. And the more you dive into it, I think the more that you'll love succulents um, just as much as I do. Before I move on to the next slide, let me share a little bit why I'm talking today um, to you, not only as a master gardener, but a lover of succulents and cactus. I grew up in Southern California and uh, grew up with a lot of ice plant, a lot of different cactus and succulents around. And then when my husband and I moved up here 20 years ago, I brought all my potted succulents and I lost a lot of them. Do I just didn't understand the weather patterns up here as far as winter's concerned. So we can grow them up here. And that's part of my passion is to let you know, hey, don't miss out on growing these type of plants. Okay, let's continue on and take a look of exactly what we're gonna cover in the next half hour. I've already covered who are master gardeners. We're gonna talk about for a minute who can grow succulents. You're going to be surprised. And then we need to understand just what are succulents? What are they? Obviously they're plants, but what makes them so special? Why grow them? And my question is who wouldn't wanna grow succulents? How do you grow them well? And there's some basic fundamental skills that if you do them well, you're gonna have some good um, experience with succulents. And then when you have plants, you're gonna probably have pests and problems. So I'm going to cover that for you. And then we'll wrap up. And then the next half hour module is on how to propagate. So let's get started. Who can grow succulents? Well, the good news is all of us in Placer County can grow succulents. Some of you may be familiar with the Sunset Climate Zone map, which is here on the left, or the USD hardiness uh, plant map. And this is important, particularly with succulents, because they can be very tender. They're strong plants, but they're also tender. And usually when you go plant shopping, there's a tag either in the plant or attached to it, and it will tell you what zone it grows in. So that's important to know. And you can go onto our Placer County Master Gardener website. There's a good article about what the zones mean, or you can physically go to Sunset, um, find that website, type in your zip code, and it will give you what zone you're in. And you can do the same for the USDA hardiness, plant hardiness map as well. And I would encourage you to do that. Because you can see I roughed in this red line that Placer County is a very long county and it encompasses a lot of different climate changes from Roseville all the way up to Tahoe City. So please do take a look at that, memorize your plant zone and you'll have much more success with all of your plants in general. All right, let's get down to the meat of this presentation. Just what are succulents? Well, ponder over this statement for a minute. All cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. So what that means, let's break that down. I like to break things down into chunks that we can understand. So succulents comes from a Latin word meaning juicy plant. And if any of you have ever broken open an aloe plant or an ice plant or any um, uh uh, succulent, you'll know just how juicy they are. There's juice that comes out and it's usually a bit slimy. Um, and so we know what it looks like and how it feels, but what does it really mean? Well, to have for a plant to display succulents really means that it's a characteristic that the plant is displaying. And it's either displaying it, um, as you look down here at the bottom slide, it's either displaying it in its roots, its stems, or its leaves. And these are specialized tissues. Think about where they grow. Succulents typically grow in semi-arid conditions and uh, cactus more in arid conditions. So the really cool part about succulents are these specialized tissues. And when they do things, normal plants carry on the activities during the day, but succulents do it at night. And I'm gonna leave you hanging with that so you'll do some more research and figure out what that means. So to be a 
succulent means you have certain characteristics, which is this storing of water. Within succulents, there are 70 to 80 plant families that display within their varieties, display some type of succulents. There's even geraniums that have succulent varieties in it. So that means there's a lot of varieties. Um, and so the sky's the limit as far as what you wanna find or do special may order. That's what makes them so special. Now I have to include cacti because they are one of the most popular succulent families, if you will. And, but a cacti, or when you talk about a cactus, you are actually talking about a plant family where a succulent is a general term or an attribute you're applying to a plant. So cactus belongs to the Cactaceae family and other things that you would know as a family, plant family would be the rose family, the lily family, grasses. Um, those are families and that means they display the same morph morphological characteristics in that family. And these are all categories so that we can talk about the different plants that we're using and understand how to best grow them. Now, what's really neat about cactus is cactus or cacti are succulents with spines. And unique only to the cactus family are these things called aerials, which are cushion-like buds. And let me show you a little bit more about that so you can impress your friends next time you go to a nursery. So succulent or cactus. So this is a succulent I have at home. This is called a century plant or an agave plant. Many of you have seen this. It often comes kind of in a gray blue color. This is a cactus I have at home. It's a night blooming cirrus. By the way, the mother plant is about 100 years old that I have. So you can see the difference right away. You can see where the spines and thorns are. Now let's get an up close and personal look here. This is a leaf off the agave plant. Um, and you can see here the succulents that I have my arrow running by. And if you squeezed it, there would be some juice that came out. You can just see how full that is. And you can see how thick the tissue is here to protect it. Now on the right is a cross section of the cactus that's up there. Um, and you can see here that it also displays succulents. Okay, and then this is a different part that is showing here, which is a whole nother different workshop. So I won't go into that. But the cool part of, look at, you can see the succulents in both of them. Now down here in number three, here's the same uh, leaf. This is the agave. You can see the thorns coming out of it. And I have the red arrow. And you can see that the thorns are coming out of the leaf margin. And, you know, if you've run up against one of these, you know how much they hurt. Now compare it to the cactus, which is a succulent. This is the aerial bud I was referring to. And when you have a cactus, you're going to see an aerial bud, but sometimes they're not as pronounced as this. And this is where the spines grow from. And this is where the flowers come from as well. Now on Christmas cactus, <clears throat> excuse me, the aerial uh, bud, is not as predominant, but they're there. And you have to look at it very closely, little hairs at the end of the Christmas cactus, that's the aerials. And a blow up of this, just so that you can tell the difference. You see the thorn coming out of the leaf margin. And this is a really cool picture. I love this. This is at one of my succulent uh, cactus at home. This is the aerial, but up close and personal. You can see all the uh, spines coming out of it. And out of this will come a flower, the stem for a flower and the flower as well. So that's just to give you a visual of the difference between succulent, succulents and cactus. Let's continue um, the talk about what are succulents with a few more um, pieces of information. Succulents are very, very old. Uh, scientists believe that they are about 50 million years old. In other words, their lineage or their ancestry goes back that far. Cactus are much younger group of uh, plants. They are about 20 million years old or the lineage they can date back 20 million. To give you a frame of reference, as far as millions of years, dinosaurs are just about, um, I believe it's 230 million years old to 60 million years old. So these are actually pretty young in comparison, but not when you're looking at it from our point of view. They're old, but they are young in the, in the bigger scope of it. 
what happened is the plants that were existing then, there was a process called convergent evolution across the plant kingdom. And what that means is different organisms evolved in similar ways across the globe under similar environmental patterns going on, but they developed it mutually exclusive from each other in different areas of the world. And so the plants um, in the succulent family, they evolved these specialized tissues to survive low water, um, low rainfalls. And then the good old cactus continued that evolutionary process um, over time. So succulents and cactus both have shallow roots that are widespreading. If you think about it, um, they live, it's in semi-arid to arid um, areas. They have to have shallow roots because when it does rain, they have to be able to take that water up very readily. They can't wait for it to trickle way down because often the rain falls fast and hard and it doesn't go very deep. And so over the years, their leaves and stems and roots became modified to be able to adapt to this environmental situation. Cactus continued on, the stems modified into pads. If you know prickly pear, those are the pads, the flat pads. They're often columnar or cylinders. And of course, the all famous Christmas and Thanksgiving cactus, you can see the joints fairly easily. Where do they hail from? Where is their lineage? Succulents um, develop mostly in Northern Europe and the Far East and with some large concentrations in Southern and Eastern Africa. And here's what's really interesting with cactus is they are native to the Americas in the arid regions and surrounding islands of the Galapagos and Caribbean. And you go, how can that be? These are wet areas. Well, that's true, but think about the Christmas cactus or some of the bromeliads um, and some of the orchids are actually categorized as cactus. So there you have it, that's where they come from. And it's important to know this so that we can better manage the plants that we have. Okay. What I'd like to do is with the next set of slides that I have for you is introduce you to some, not all, but some of the varieties that we can grow in Placer County. And over the years with my interest in uh, succulents, I've tried to compile a list for you that's not um, exhaustive, but it's partial and it's a beginning so that you can have some success in growing succulents. Don't be afraid of them. They're hardy plants, but they do need some tender care. So I know a lot of you are familiar with agaves. There's all sorts of agaves out there. This is a picture I took at a botanical garden. It's artichoke agave. And I just love to look at the patterns. Look at the pattern here and look how the leaves unfold and look at the teeth along the edge of the leaf here. That's one clue that it's a succulent, okay? And then the pointed uh, thorn at the end. The century plant here, you see it has an asterisk. Anything on these lists and the handouts that I've given that you'll have are Arboretum All-Stars UC Davis. And what that means is they have been looking into plants that do well in Sacramento area that will probably do well in Placer County if you do a little um, tweaking and maximize your uh, uh, microclimates, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. This is a picture of a, a century plant at the Sonoma um, Sunset Gardens um, out there in Sonoma. I would encourage you to visit. It's a nice little um, garden out there. So lots of other agaves. You do have a handout that lists all these, so don't worry about listing them down. There's a handout that has the same information. Continuing with agaves, some of you may be familiar with the coral yucca, which is this picture up in the right-hand corner, or the hummingbird yucca. And you see I have a little hummingbird I've insert, inserted there. They love those plants. They are low maintenance. The most you really have to do is just cut off those flowering stems once they're spent. All kinds of other yuccas. Look at the Spanish dagger in the right-hand corner. They're really quite beautiful, but I understand why they're called daggers because you run up against one of those and it's going to hurt. Continuing on to some of the varieties that we can grow, we have the ice plant and lithops family, and I'm going to pronounce this only once. <laughs> the family name is Azoaceae, and with that's also a very large family of succulents right up there with um, cactus. 
And you may be familiar with Cooper's Ice Plant. That's an Arboretum All-Star. And you see the picture here where my pointer is. And I've noticed, I'm up in Auburn, I've noticed there's more uh, people growing the ice plant up here. You could easily grow it down in Roseville and Rockland. They're just beautiful. And I remember that growing up in Southern Cal when they would all bloom at once in mass. It makes quite the statement. This is down, the second picture down is at Monterey Bay. My husband and I were there visiting when they were blooming. I just love it. And down here is the third type I've listed are lithops or living stones or pebble plants. These are really interesting plants, interesting succulents. My experience in Auburn, they don't grow so well outside because they do have a tender uh, tissue, the tender skin of them. But when you get online and look at pictures as you become more interested in succulents, a lot of these blend in with the rocks or pebbles and you can't tell the difference between the plant and the pebbles. And I always just look at them and go, how did they do that? How did nature encourage that and evolve into that? That's what's so cool about succulent. Okay, moving on to another variety that can be grown in Placer County. I know a lot of you have aloes, um, probably in your backyard or in a pot. They're very com common and they have a ton of varieties in them. Um, this one down in the bottom was taken again at the Sonoma Cornerstone Gardens, uh, Sunset Gardens. And there's just a lot of different ones you can grow. You just wanna make sure you can grow it in your climate zone, the sunset or USD hardiness. I like to include this slide just for the beauty of it. Look at this aloe, this is an aloe farm. I'm guessing it's the common aloe that's used for beauty products, but look at the color and the shape of that. Who said succulents aren't pretty plants? I'm not sure who said that, but they're not right because they are gorgeous. This is an aloe plant I have on the side of my house. You can see that never fails to bloom, it has a single stem that comes up with these beautiful blossoms here. And these are some aloe plants along the coast of California, just wild growing in mass and they're just dramatic. Okay, then we have succulent varieties, uh, crassula varieties that you can grow that are common succulents. You'll, also, you'll often see them as a plant filler in a pot. They'll also, um, they're great for hanging over in a pot. These are eoneums. Um, this up here, again, this is on the side of my house. My sister calls them Dr. Seuss plants. You can't really see it right here, but you see here's another one. It's uh, dark, dark purple. They grow up on the stem and they have this beautiful um, arrangement here of their leaves and they're easy, easy to propagate, but you'll have to see the second part of this presentation to know how to propagate them. Again, these are all from my garden. This is my favorite one down here. You see my mouse. This is called a ghost plant and it just has this haze around it, this beautiful coloring. They're very thick leaves, so they're good for propagation. These are echeverias. Continue with crassula because they are such an easy succulent to grow. You see my century plant in the background and in the foreground here are, is a sedum that comes back every year. And what it does is it grows the stem and the flower comes out. And this is kind of a pretty pink coral flower. On your right is a mix of sedums and some pervivims um, out of my garden. You can see the donkey tail or burl's tail here. And this is a true semper, sempervium plant. This is what we call hens and chicks. You can see the stolen follow my mouse. You can see the stolen coming out of the mother plant to grow its chicks or its babies, if you will. Lots of cool ways to use succulents. And then you can't forget the euphorbias and spurges. On the right, the two far right pictures is a crown of thorns. These grow usually the best indoors in our area. Don't let these spines fool you. It's not a cactus. It is a succulent. Um, uh, it's not considered a cactus. It's in a different, it's in the euphorbia family. But this is actual picture, the one with the hummingbird a friend sent me from Southern California. He's sitting there on a stem, probably deciding which flower to choose or which flower matches his beautiful red chest. Fire sticks, these are actually green. And the reason you see these turn red um, is they're under stress and they create that color 
in response to water issues or temperature issues or lighting issues. I bet you didn't know that, but this is a color we want. And so it gets a little stress and produces that for us. Okay. I haven't had much luck growing those up here in Auburn. I've tried um, and I don't bring any of my plants, any of my succulents or cactus in. Um, they get covered if there's a frost. So I just think it does, just doesn't do well in Auburn, but probably does well in Roseville and Rockland. Okay, well, those are some of the varieties for you. And again, there's, uh, be sure you look at the handout. There's more, more listed there for you. So if I haven't got you excited about the varieties that we can grow, don't be afraid of growing succulents. Let me tell you a little bit more why you could be interested in growing more succulents and have them in your garden. Well, first and foremost is they're drought tolerant. It doesn't mean they don't need any water, they do, but they are low water users. And think about their evolutionary process. They adapted because of the low water that was available to them. And they came from rainy areas, but where it would rain a lot and then just stop for the rest of the season. So they had to adapt to low water. And that's what's cool about them is we don't have to use a lot of water. And since we keep getting hit with these different droughts as our climate changes and things that are going on globally, they're an awesome plant. And I've been doing some recent reading about them and they're becoming even more and more popular than they have over the past five years because we're probably gonna have to move to a lot of these type of plants. I love them because of the aesthetics they provide they are low maintenance. You just know how to need to know how to treat them well. They are a great source for pollinators. This is my cirrus, night blooming cirrus that I have. This is a cutting off of the family uh, plant I have, the mother plant. And you can see how the bees are just going in there with the pollen that they have. They just love it. Now these night blooming cirrus, it's a beautiful flower, but it's night blooming because that's when it opens up. And so you have to catch it early morning to see these beautiful blooms. But see this stem coming out? That's coming out of the aerial, that pad I explained earlier. And then this flower opens up at night and then it closes up and then it opens up and closes up. You have so many different growing options. I'm gonna show you some creative ways to use them. And of course, commercially, it's becoming more popular, not just for health products or beauty products, but as far as hmm, we need to think about plants that are low water usage. Let me show you some pictures. I get so excited when I look at these. Look at this picture on the left, the far left. That's actually a cactus. And I look at it and go, how did it decide to have that figure? <laughs> look at the uniqueness of that. And this is a picture taken at the UC Berkeley Botanical Gardens. They have a nice collection of succulents that are in their greenhouse as well as planted throughout. Then this is a century plant. You see my pointer here. This is at um, another garden I visited and I didn't even notice this until the docent at the uh, botanical gardens in Berkeley pointed out. So it's look at these saw teeth here. That's a clue that it's a succulent. It doesn't have the pad that we're looking for for cactus. You can see the pointed tip here, see where my mouse is. But look at this pattern inside of the leaf. Look at down here, follow my mouse, the pointer. Where do you think those patterns came from? Well, you see this in the center, those are the leaves that are rolled tightly together before it opens up. And what it is, it's the impression of the leaf below it or underneath it, if you will. And I never knew that till last, I think it was last year when we went to the botanical gardens there in Berkeley. But look at the patterns of that. How can you not sit there and look at it and go, wow, what a conversation piece. And on the right is a picture of, um, I just love the symmetry. Look at this circle. Um, it's just beautiful. Down here on your left-hand corner where my mouse is, this is from the um, Albuquerque Botanical Gardens. My husband and I were down there a number of years ago. I couldn't find the name of it, but it's a succulent and it grows along the ground. It's all these corkscrew things. They're aesthetically, that's part of the reason I love them is they're just so different looking. Why else grow um, succulents? Well, 
For horticultural reasons, um, the picture on the right, upper right, is um, you'll see this more in Southern California, Mexico, New Mexico, where they actually use it as a fence. Because who's going to run into a fence of cactus with a bunch of thorns and spines? I've seen some up here in Placer County where people are beginning to use prickly pears as a border. And prickly pears, depending on what variety you have, can have very, very long um, uh, thorns out of its uh, uh, tissue. Agave, they're using that as biofuel. And also see this rope here, the center picture, that's sisal. If you've heard of sisal rope, it comes from a type of agave plant. You can get online uh, and look at how they process that. It's pretty neat. Food, agave sweetener became very popular about five, six years ago. Some of you may be familiar with um, tequila, if you have a margarita or a tequila shot. Indigenous people, if you think about it, the areas where succulents and cactus are, they've learned and over the years learned how to maximize using those. And I even read an article where some areas use succulents for livestock food. So that's some good reasons to um, grow and get interested in succulents and get ahead of the wave because we're in droughts um, periodically and these plants are gonna make it. Now, if that didn't get you excited enough, let me show you some creative ways to grow succulents. The picture on the left here where my mouse is, is a chevron design with succulents in it. And this was actually at the San Francisco Flower Conservatory. I would encourage anyone to go there. It's a nice um, uh, conservatory that you go in and look and they had this for sale and it's pretty expensive, but you can create your own and do this. The middle picture is a giant living wall. This is down, uh, I go down to visit my sister in Southern Cal every Thanksgiving and my husband and I and my sister went to Descanso Gardens. And I remember going there when I was a kid to look at the camellias. They have a nice collection of different cactus and succulents as well. This wall is really tall. And um, you can see the lights up at the top that they light it up as it starts getting dark and it just looks so pretty. That's just, that's a lot of succulent. Another garden on the right, I visited Sherman Gardens down in Laguna Beach. It's a nice small little garden. I would encourage you if you ever go down that way. They use succulents in some of their stairs and there's a blow up picture down here. You can see the succulents peeking out. You could do that at home. It's just very interesting and different. Some other ways to grow it. You see, this is a picture someone took of growing the upper top middle one of growing just a bunch of succulents in an old uh, log, a piece of log. On the right here where my mouse is, this is one of my favorite ones. Look at these succulents flowing out. It looks like water flowing out. That's one of my goals to do in my garden. If you have a frost, all you would do is cover that with a sheet or one of the frost cloths that you can buy. Look at this picture down here in the middle. You can see a tree growing out of it and it's in a pot and it's all surrounded by different succulents. Now, one thing, if you do that, you wanna make sure the water requirements are the same for the succulent as it is for the plant that's in there. So maybe a good idea would be to plant a citrus tree, a patio citrus tree, because that um, citrus typically like to have their roots a little bit dry and then watered, which is like succulents. So it's just some creative ways, sky's the limit on that. Okay, so now hopefully I've convinced you that succulents are cool plants to grow. Um, well, let's talk about how you're gonna grow them. How can we make you most successful in growing and venturing out and using succulents in your garden? If you already grow succulents, then this is a reminder, don't forget to do these things. And there's seven elements I'd like for you to consider. So let's go over each of those in detail. The first element is choose the right plant for the right place. As a gardener, I know you've heard this. Some of us go to these gardening stores or big box stores and we get so excited, we just start buying plants. And that's fine, but you wanna check their tags and see if, as it says, identify your gardening zone. That's why it's important for you to know your sunset in your US hardiness zone maps. Know what area that you're in. So when you choose your plant, you'll have success with it. 
The other thing you want to consider, it's the second bullet point, is consider your microclimate. And what a microclimate is, is a climate within a climate. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say you live on an acre and part of your area that your backyard is in or your front yard is hilly. So you have a hill, you have the top of the hill and you have the bottom of the hill. Well, what do we know about cold air? Cold air sinks, warm air rises. Also, if you're at the top of a hill, when there's wind, it's going to, anything you put up there is going to have the wind factor. So know your microclimate because if your succulent is borderline, whether it's in your climate or not, you might may be able to make it work by maximizing your microclimate or the climate within a climate. For example, if you plant some succulents at the bottom of that hill, that may not be the best idea because when we do get cold weather, it's going to be even colder down there. So know your microclimate, and you know that as you get familiar with your yard, if you're not already. On the right um, is a picture of the first year my husband and I moved up to Auburn, that was 20 years ago. I brought my cactus and succulents from Southern California. I had them in all in pots, and a big snowstorm hit, which is kind of unusual anymore. But you can see the cactus got covered with a lot of snow, and the good news is it survived because it was self-insulating with the snow on it. But you do need to watch the weather up here if there's a frost, okay? The second element you want to consider for successful growing of succulents is consider your succulents growing in dormant seasons. And that's true with any plant, actually. Those of you that grow citrus or have vegetable gardens, you need to know the particulars of your plant. And that's especially true with succulents because they are tender to frost. They won't survive frost. And this is in your handout as well. And this is common sense, the growth cycle and dormancy cycle. Those are in response to changes in temperature and water, and then also to cooler temperature and lower moisture. So it's important to know for your succulent to know when to transplant them, when to water, when to fertilize them, just like you would with any other plant that you have. Again, this information is in the handout that you can print out for yourself. There are summer growers, which means they go dormant in the winter. That doesn't mean they're die, they just go dormant. They slow everything down. And winter growers, where they actually do best growing during their growing period in the winter and their summer uh, dormancy. Now, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but if you have had uh, aloe or crassula and it's not doing very much during the summer, well, that's because it's dormant, it has slowed down. So you wanna take that into factoring when you're growing these and when you place them together in pots or in the ground. Again, this is in your handout, so please pay attention to that. It's an important element. The third element is temperature. Succulents is a third bullet point down there in cactus. They can usually survive up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit as their minimum temperature. When it goes below that, you do want to cover them and protect them because frost will kill your succulents. You can see this picture here that the plant has just become mushy. You can either bring them in, put them in a greenhouse. Some people bring them into the garage and cover them. Me, I don't move my plants around. I just cover them. What happens with succulents, if you think about it and go back to what makes them so unique, it's their specialized tissues that, that hold on to water. And when these specialized cells get too much water or they get frozen, the cell wall breaks, it breaks open, and that uh, is released into the plant and it becomes mushy. And there's no recovering from that. You would have to cut this part off Maybe the stem, you might, if you propagated, you might get some growth um, through that. But they're going to self-implode, if you will. So you do need to cover them. Protect them from wind. And second, the second bullet point here is you want to provide some really good air circulation to avoid getting very many pests and problems with them. Lighting is important, just like with any of our other plants. You want to know what the plant wants and what the succulent wants. Bright light's pretty good. You want to take a look at the uh, sun exposure, usually place it on a southern, southwest, or southeasting facing slope. Some succulents only like morning sun, um, not the afternoon sun. Um, so pay attention to that 
because you could scorch or burn the leaves. Some exceptions are to this rule are the Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving cactus. And again, um, uh, take a look at the handouts I've given you. And the reason for that with their water requirements and lighting requirements, depending on the time of year, is think about where these Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving cactus come from. They come from the top tropical jungles, particularly in Brazil and at the treetops. So they need the wetness, but not too much and not too little. Water, very, very important. It's a fifth element. Overwatering is the number one cause of succulents dying. They don't like to be too wet. Let them do what they're meant to do. They have the specialized tissue cells. They have the shallow roots so they can take up water. So don't overwater your plants. They're gonna become a mush, a pile of mush. They just can't take in that much water. There's only so much space at the end, if you will. So what you do with succulents and cactus is you water thoroughly. Go ahead and let the water run through the pot several times because potting soil doesn't take up water the same way. It usually goes around the edges. So you wanna give it several doses and then let it almost dry out. And I like to use the finger test. I put my finger down into the uh, soil or into the pot and see how it's doing. Minimum water during the dormant season. You don't need to give them a lot of water. So you need to go to your list and see when your succulent is dormant. And you start withholding uh, the water in the fall for most succulents. The exceptions, of course, are Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving. Don't overwater your, water your succulents. It will kill them. Element number six, you want to use a planting mix um, specialized for cactus or suc succulents if you're going to plant it in the ground. You know, up at, here in Auburn and a lot of part of Placer County has the clay. Clay is not a bad soil. Um, you want to amend it and make sure it drains well. But if you plant it in the ground, which I don't up here in Auburn, is the clay soil will hold on to the moisture and that could rot the roots of your plant. I do all mine in pots, but there are people that put them in the ground and they do just fine, but you wanna make sure your uh, soil is mixed with a lightweight cactus mix. I use the bag anymore. I just have a brand that I like to use. If I'm propagating, I'll add some perlite to it to make it even more lighter and fluffier. The important thing is Whatever you put your succulent in, it needs to be well draining mix or soil, okay? You, you can mulch the top of it with volcanic rock. You'll see that, the small volcanic rock, some perlite. You'll see that when we propagate. Don't use wood mulch. Um, it's not good and don't let it, as far as for succulents, it holds in too much wetness and if it touches a succulent, it can rot it. Um, uh, and anytime you use any type of mulch, whether it's rock or perlite or gravel, you want to make sure it's away from the bottom of the plant. Don't put it right up against to the base of the plant because that causes uh, fungal and root issues. And finally, the seventh element, which you don't really need to worry very much about succulents, is you want to fertilize it during the growing season. And again, that's why you want to know when your succulent is growing and when it's dormant. Most of the succulents uh, are spring and summer, but again, look at your list. Um, if you do use a fertilizer, you can use whatever you have on hand. As master gardeners, we like to have you try organic fertilizer. It's less harmful on the environment, but whatever works for you, go ahead and use it. But you want to use a well-balanced fertilizer, and you see that down here in the second bullet point. You want to use what well-balanced means is an even mix of of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the uh, example I have there is 10, 10, 10. When you hear that, that means 10 uh, nitrogen, 10 phosphorus, 10 potassium, whatever strength that uh, measurement is being used. You only need to use a quarter to a half strength of whatever fertilizer that you have, and maybe just one time a year. Again, depending on your pot and how quick it drains, because that's gonna be a little different. The fertilizer doesn't stay in as long. Foliar fertilizer is not recommended. First of all, it can um, burn your leaves when the sun hits it. And because the leaves of succulents or the stem is pretty waxy and thick, it just doesn't um, permeate into the plant. So there you have the seven elements. If you do those well, 
your succulents are going to do well for you as well. And you're going to have success and you're going to want to do more of it. Where there's plants, there's going to be some pests and problems, but let me take a look and see what we can do about it. This is a picture of a giant praying mantis on the roof. This is at the UC uh, Berkeley Botanical Gardens. It just cracked me up. Um, I think I'd probably pass out if I saw a praying mantis that big, but um, you just never know. But I thought it was funny, so I've included it for you. Now, you have a handout on this, and in the handout of how to manage pest and problems, it lists the problem on the left or the pest, and then the solution on the right. I don't have that on the PowerPoint because it's just too much information. <clears throat> Excuse me. For you to absorb in our short time together. So let me just highlight. There's a couple pests that I have that are most common <clears throat> for people that grow succulents or cactus. And that's the good old aphid here in this first picture on the left. You can see the aphids on there. And yes, there are black colored aphids as well as white aphids. Now you would handle aphids on a succulent or cactus the same way you would on a regular plant. We recommend that you try spraying it off with water first because they just fall down and they don't come back up. You probably have to do that repeatedly throughout the season, particularly when there's new growth on it or if you've used too much nitrogen. Aphids love the new tender growth that's coming out of a plant. If that doesn't work, <coughs> and when you do spray your plant, <coughs> you wanna use a gentle spray Excuse me. You want to use a gentle spray because you don't want to bruise the leaves on your succulents. Up on the right hand side, you see mealybugs. These are these white cottony. You see here where my pointer is, and you can see the little <coughs> mealybugs. That's the second most common problem, usually with um, pests and succulents. You can see the um, cottony web they've spun, that's where their little ones are in the inside. <clears throat> now, if you just have a minor outbreak of mealybugs, excuse me, you can dab a um, Q-tip in some rubbing alcohol and just whisk that away and whisk that one away. Now, if you have a bigger infestation, you want to use a, <clears throat> an insecticidal soap something organic that will help you with that. Or if it's really bad, you just want to throw the plant away with the soil because the little mealy bugs come out of the soil. Continuing with pest and um, animals, you've got scales sometimes with uh, cactus, snails and slugs, worms and caterpillars. Manage those the same way that you would with your other plants. <clears throat> Environmental. These are things that we can control. Cold damage, again, with frost, if it's going to frost, if it's going to get below 40, maybe 30, 35, you want to cover your plant. This plant here has been damaged. These leaves cannot recover. Maybe if you trim these off, you might be able to do some transplanting and save it. But again, the cells will self-implode. You can see this bottom picture here. Look at this mess here. This is from overwatering. The plant just exploded on itself inside of itself. And as a result, that was a great opportunity for some water mold to develop. And that plant is pretty much a goner. So be careful about overwatering. If you damage your plant with by mechanical or physical means, watch out um, because that's a way for fungus to happen as well. Continuing with environmental, if you do spray any chemical or insecticidal soap, <coughs> don't do it in the sun because you can burn the leaves. Many of you have seen pot bound um, plants that you get from the nursery or maybe that you've had hanging out. This is an example here. Just take it out of the pot, gently separate the roots and propagate it. Okay, just be gentle with it. Scorch damage, cactus and succulents can get burned and you can see that on the right on this barrel cactus. Underwatering is this picture down here. Now that's an underwatered um, cactus. You can see how it's shriveling up. Listen to your plant, it will tell you what it needs. 
And then finally, there's fungus and other things that want to play havoc with your plants. The fungus, um, if you do the seven elements well and practice those well, you won't have as many of these fungus problems because fungus likes to go where it's damp. So keep your growing area clean. Don't overwater your plant. Um, on the handout that you have, there's uh, more specific things to do if you run up against these. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of things in the past half hour. Um, let's do a quick summary because this is gonna keep you plenty busy if you decide to dive into succulents. Let me wrap up my time with you by saying, um, we've gone over a lot of information. I hope that you explore it more further. Go to the resource list that you can print out. Check that out, get more interested. There's a lot of good information out there. You found out who master gardeners are. We're all over the place and we're here to help you. You found out that you can grow succulents. Dive into it, give it a try. Um, you're gonna get excited about once you get the hang of it. We can grow them here in Placer County. We define what are succulents so that you know the plant that you're treating, it gives you a better idea of what its needs are and you can adapt to that. Why grow succulents? Again, my question is why not grow succulents? Who wouldn't want to grow succulents? Get on the front part of the wave as droughts are getting more common. Get your garden set up with some succulents and cactus. We talked about the seven elements to successfully grow your succulents. Please, they're pretty easy guidelines. And if you follow those, <coughs> excuse me. If you follow those seven elements of growing succulents, you're gonna do pretty good. Trust me on that. And how do you manage pests and problems? Where you have plants, you're gonna have some pests and problems. And there's lots of solutions on that handout you have. I hope that you'll join me for the second half of this presentation, which is how to propagate succulents. You're not gonna to wanna to stop. You're gonna have succulents coming out of your ears once you get turned on to how easy they are to grow. I'd like to thank you at this time for joining us and letting Master Gardeners be part of your gardening world. I don't have any um, questions here that I can answer because this is a recorded session, but be sure to tap into our different resources. We have the hotline. The hotline has to do with composting. You can call there and of course visit our website. And I thank you very much for joining me today. I hope to see you at some of our public events. And again, thank you, Sandy and Barbara, for making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. That's just, she's so enthusiastic about succulents that it just makes me want to go out and start planting a container garden with succulents right away. This concludes our presentation today. This is part one of the wonderful world of succulents. Part two, remember, is the propagation workshop, and you can find that on our website. Let me remind you that the links and the handouts that Diane referenced today, and also the links and handouts for the propagation workshop, can all be found at our website. That's pcmg.ucanr.org. It's under Upcoming Events, Virtual Recordings. You also can check out that website for any of our future um, workshops that are going to happen. They're still all virtual. So our next workshop is Saturday, June 26th, and our topic is California native plants for habitat gardening. Please remember that if you're in a different county than Placer or another area somewhere in the world, you should consult your local master gardeners or other experts to learn about the geographic or climatic differences in your garden. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day.